Well, while these extraordinary directors are getting suited up and ready, getting their game faces on, I want to thank the DGA, as always, for hosting this event. It's, it's such a delight. I want to thank Betty Thomas for that amazingly adequate introduction. Uh, uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, I'll try to live up to it, by the way. <laughs> um, this year um, uh, is the first time that uh, this new, this DGA award for what we used to call long form television, uh, the name has changed. It uh, For over a half a century, it was called the award for the best movie or miniseries, certainly uh, some of these projects would be called miniseries today, but now it's limited series, which reflects the new world order of television. Uh, and it's, uh, it's time we moved into it, and I'm glad we are. Uh, so, because now if it's, uh, if it's streaming, if, it's, uh, if it can be put on any kind of instrument anywhere, Netflix will make a show out of it. And uh, we are, we'll officially come into the new, the new era. So, um, uh, let's get let's get right into it tonight because we have a limited amount of time. Um, let's let's begin with this. If there's a if there's a commonality among uh, the three shows that each of you represent, other than the excellence, it occurs that that each one of these films that you bring to us this year are 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 they seem at first glance like they could be just uh, they could be thought of as genre pieces. Escape at Denimore is uh, uh, the prison breakout film. Uh, Sharp Objects, the Southern Gothic murder mystery. Uh, even uh, even Jesus Christ Superstar is is uh, another broadcast uh, Broadway musical that we're that we're doing for live television. And yet, each of these films, each of your films, transcends the the label of genre uh, so remarkably. Uh, ben, I want to start with you. Oh, okay. Just your life. <laughs> How did Escape uh, at Dannemora come into your life? I want I, you can perhaps touch on that. And was there a point when you ask yourself, uh, "How, for the love of God, can I make this different from Escape from Alcatraz?" Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know why it came to me. I was, I was sent uh, a couple of scripts by the writers and uh, the producer Brian Zuriff and. Uh, I, I don't know what the process was that they that they thought I would be the right guy to direct this because I hadn't really done anything like that before. But for me, as a uh, as a director and a fan of um, that kind of drama, I was really excited to get it because it's what I, it, for me is the kind of thing I grew up watching and that I a genre I loved as an audience. And um, the challenge, yeah, the challenge was for myself was how, why, why should I do this? As an audience, I know why I'd watch it, but why should I direct it? And I knew I had the desire to direct it because I thought the story was so fascinating and so interesting. Uh, and, and the reality of what happened to me was what drew me into it. That I, at first they sent me these scripts that they had, they had fictionalized because they didn't really have that much information about what had really happened. And I, and I passed on it because I didn't know enough about what happened. I felt that was my way in. Um, how something like these guys could saw through their cells in 2015 in this old style prison break. How does that happen uh, nowadays? Um, so when this Inspector General report came out uh, a few months after I'd passed on it, that was a 160 page sort of uh, Bible of what had happened and had all these great details. That was for me the key into it. And I said, I called them up. I said, if you still need a director, why don't we start from scratch with this and go for everything uh, that's in here and try to tell the story in as real a way as possible. And that's, for me, what I thought could maybe make it a little bit different. Um, and also the fact that Tilly, Patricia Arquette's character, was such a huge part of the story and how these men manipulated uh, this woman and uh, really uh, took her down this road of promising her a life that she uh, sort of dreamed of and she bought and went for. And I just thought it, it transcended what a typical prison story might be because of that element. And Sharp Objects, Jean-Marc, uh, were, uh, were you offered the, f when, you offered, when you were offered the film, did you immediately contemplate, how do I make this different? Was it instant? Or is that maybe something that a director throughout the process is asking themselves, how do I do this in a fresh way? 
Yeah, I, I mean, with the crew, with the DP, and uh, there was a film noir aspect to it that we wanted to revisit in some ways with color, though, not with black and white. But uh, it, was, it was an invitation from uh, Amy Adams. Uh, that was her first, uh, she got the book, and, uh, and it was going to be her first TV series. And, uh, and I was working at, at uh, uh, back then uh, on something else, whatever, that didn't work out. And she sent the book, and I read it, and I went, uh, wow. You 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 want to play this character, mm -hmm. and I, I I mean I was I was in more to see Amy Adams doing her thing and her magic with uh, Camille Preaker than than the whole thing. Although the book is a page turner, it's amazing. It's so well written. Book by Gillian Flynn, by who Gillian was also Flynn. an executive producer. Yes, and it's so special. It's a it's a ride that I've, I've never read something like this. I've never read. I've never met, I've never read a character like Camille Preaker, I've never met someone like this in life. And Gillian has a mind of its own and uh, she can go dark and dark. And it's hurting, it's heartbreaking. The relationship and the history of abuse between these women and this family is, is cruel and heartbreaking. And yet you want, you see that they're fighting and they're, trying to love each other. There's a beautiful family story behind that murder mystery, and Amy, uh, Amy, Amy got it, and, 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 um, and I went, yeah, all right, I'm in. Let's, uh, let's do this, and uh, that's it. And you, you were just coming off uh, Big Little Lies, right? You, did you have any rest? No, that's why I look like I look. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I'm on a break right now. I was posting. Uh, I was posting uh, Big Little Lies. We weren't done, and we were starting to prep sharp objects. And uh, yeah, that was a tough. Uh, so, so they said we've wounded him. Let's let's finish him off now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, it's a matter of circumstances, and the two projects became, you know, like this. And uh, and I love the 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 two projects. And it's uh, it's uh. uh Although it was, it's a marathon, and, and Ben did it also, you know, directing for, I think his was 118 days of shooting nonstop. I mean, it's, it's, it's a marathon. It's a, How many were your two back-to-back? -back? Uh, uh, Sharp was 92. BLL was 90. So in, in almost two years, in 20 months, we shot 182 days. Five-day uh, weeks? Five-day a week, but although we shot nine to six. So... That's that's at least we can. I, I was waking up around seven thirty, and uh, and then going to work, arriving at uh, quarter to nine, and doing the day until six. Sometimes okay, six thirty seven, and if we have to start later during the afternoon, we finish later at night. But at least we 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 could have a decent. Uh, we could recharge the batteries uh, as we were doing this marathon, and uh, but it's great. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, I want to go back to the feature, the 40 day of shooting uh, next, <laughs> but uh, but I, I really loved it. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's thrilling. It's exciting, and you get creative on the day, and you do it every day. And then I was I was thinking of those directors uh, from the 40s, like Michael Curtis and directing 52 films in their careers and just going to work every day for every year for the studios and working probably 150 days, 100 to 150 days a, a year shooting. And, and, and the crew and I, since from BLL to Sharp Objects, were using pretty much the same crew. And so we were thinking we're, that this is what they were going through back then. And this, this was the norm, you know, to, for a director to be hired and direct and be on the set and uh, and uh, and uh, and it's it's a uh, it's a learning really a great learning experience. Well, David and Alex, the dynamic duo, and we'll. Uh, I want you to talk. First of all, I do want you to talk a little bit about because for some of these folks, may not quite understand who does what when it comes to directed by. And what what is the credit? Uh, uh, live uh, television live directed television by. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but let's let's start with David. How did how did uh, 
you know, it's it's not like in a, in one sense, Jesus Christ Superstar is unique, but it's not like television hasn't been through a spate of live musical adaptations. Um, did you think about that? Uh, did um, did you see? And they have been largely successful. Did you think uh, was was that intimidating to you? Was it uh, inspiring or, or irrelevant? Um, that was relevant. I mean, in the sense that you know, I thought. I mean, I think my first reaction when they asked me to do it was, apart from you know the fact that I've I've always loved that piece ever since I saw it as a teenager. You know, it's one of those pieces that sticks in your mind. But um, I think <clears throat> in the first sort of hour or so after they called me, uh, my ambition probably uh, didn't extend beyond thinking how I could avoid you know getting crucified before Jesus <laughs> because. Uh, the vicissitudes of, um, you know, doing live musicals uh, live on TV, you know, when everybody, of course, has an opinion. Um, and uh, the thought, okay, we're going to be there for two hours while Twitter, the Twitter sphere explodes. And um, in fact, I think I'm, I, well, I think I invented the word. I probably didn't actually when I thought that the word Twitter fiction, which was my alternative to the crucifixion that I thought, oh, this could, this could be something. Um, but, but, the, um, but then, of course, you know, at the end of the day, um, everything worthwhile um, c can be a disaster. Um, so, um, so I put that aside very quickly and, uh, and just thought, what an interesting challenge to find a way, you know, to send the extraordinary youthful voltage of this piece that Andrew and Tim made when they were in their very early 20s, um, you know, through TV screens um, across the land um, and, uh, and make it work for people of faith and not of faith, which was a key. Uh, and, uh, you know, to try to give it a sense of what I'd felt when I first saw it, which was awe. Um, and so that's where it started for me. And, uh, you know, of course I had to say yes, but luckily, um, <clears throat> Uh, Alex, uh, I knew was going to be uh, alongside with me, and Alex was a veteran of the broadcast musical, uh, and so I knew that would be an exciting relationship. Well, for, and, and indeed, for those, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, because Alex was here last year for, uh, uh, was it uh, Greece? It was last year? Is it Greece or Hesper did, Hesper I can't remember. He, he, well, uh, Alex has been the musical, uh, excuse me, the television director for Grease, Hairspray, which leads me to ask, why weren't you asking yourself, really, am I up for this again? <laughs> I must be doing something wrong or right. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think every work that we, we undertake and every, every uh, production we look at uh, to bring it to the screen brings its own challenges and, and you, you're always trying to reinvent yourself and you're always trying to look at the work and the book and try and figure out a fresh take on, on on broadcasting that work, and you try and in, in conjunction. So, so, for those that are that aren't aware of the of the kind of duopoly, the relationship between the two of us, David's there's like a stage director and a live television director, who, who, which is me and. and David very much works with with the cast and, and 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 the chemistry between the cast and developing the book and the narrative of the story uh, and and in, we work in conjunction in terms of blocking scenes and figuring out how uh, the cinematography will work and then I, I will develop that and create and storyboard basically the entire show uh, and then execute that and for the technical teams and call it on the night. Um, so it, it, it starts off slightly more weighted to the stage director's work, and then it ends up on the night a little more weighted in my world. Um, but in order to succeed, very much we need to be joined at the hip, and we need to understand um, uh, perfectly each other's vision uh, and support each other, and and really try and be on a on a, on a tangential but parallel course um, whereby we support each other all the way through the process. Um, but yes, that, I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's very humbling being in, in your company and because, you know, we're all bringing movies and narrative and story to the screen in, in a slightly different context. Um, but um, ultimately, you know, it, it's, it's just having, um, having the canvas to be able to tell those stories in an intriguing and different and visceral way. And that's what we try and all, you know, motivate ourselves towards doing. 
Well, uh, uh, in this evening, for those of you who might be here for the first time, we traditionally, when we talk with directors about the outstanding work that, that they've done and why they're on this stage, we break uh, the director's role uh, into the three periods uh, the, of, of making a movie, uh, prep, uh, production, and then post-production. So let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do that. Let's get into the idea of uh, prepping the films or, uh, or uh, that you did. And uh, uh, Jean-Marc, I'm thinking, here you are. Uh, I, I want to talk about casting a little bit. Because all of all of the casting in all of these films is terrific. But you, here you have Amy Adams, you have Patricia Clarkson, you have uh, Eliza Scanlon, who played the young uh, half sister of Camille Amy Adams in the clip. Um, but let's take Amy because Amy was instrumental uh, at the very beginning. How did how did um, how did how do you begin with an actor like Amy? I mean, do you have this? I'm curious. Did you have this mating dance of the first lunch that you get together, or did you know her before, or, or when did she come into the project? Did she recruit you? Did you cast her? How did that start, and how do you deal with the star relationship at the beginning? Well, as as I said earlier, it was an invitation from her, and. Uh, that I accepted, and uh, I was uh, honored, and uh, and uh, and I wanted. Uh, I felt, you know, uh, I felt grateful and thankful, and I wanted to serve not only the project but serve uh, Amy, and uh, try to uh, be there for her to portray that um, that uh, special, uh, pretty unique uh, character. So. Uh, she's, uh, I mean, you know, being a me, being who she is, uh, that, uh, we, we didn't have a lot of prep and we had a, we had a very, uh, uh, a specific schedule because of some, uh, some, uh, contingencies, some, uh, some, uh, limitations for, for, from Amy and from other actors. So, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's a matter of, um, we had a, a lunch or two. And it's a matter of trust. And I do my homework. She does her homework. So as the other actors, and uh, and um, uh, uh, it, it it happened. And then it happens on the on, on the day uh, when we start shooting. And we we uh, we started to meet in the morning in her trailer to talk about the day and sometimes about the week, but mainly about the day, about where her character is, where she was. Uh, about the continuity and about the you know the sense of the scenes and the sense of what we're about to do today and uh, and uh, since we're not always shooting in continuity so so she wanted to have this moment in the morning to talk and she's very you know cerebral and she's very bright she's very intelligent she has a way of talking about what about understanding the intentions and and I was in awe every morning you know and I was more listening than talking and uh, and and uh, and then as soon as we were going on on the set and she was ready and we were shooting bang it becomes instinct and uh, and it's happening and it's like she you know and she doesn't talk anymore about it it's just happening and because uh, did, did you have a traditional rehearsal period with your cast, however short? Or no, no, we we uh, we um, unless unless it's uh, it has to be technical, and uh, but we didn't. Uh, for, I, I've been uh, doing this for years, where we uh, we just uh, trust the process, and 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 we we uh, as I said, you know, we 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 meet uh, uh, in prep. If we need to talk about certain scenes and characters and the arc and some intentions and what kind of emotion and tone of the film and this and that, but then uh, the way we shoot, available light, you know, and this project, uh, it was it was it was okay to do it again since uh, Cafe the Floor. We've been uh, we've been working with this approach where we shoot available light, handheld, asking the crew to get out of the set. And to uh, and we try to shoot 360 degrees. We don't cut between shots. We shoot and shoot, and uh, and and then we get creative, and it becomes uh, 
it becomes a there's something it creates a, a some space of freedom you know for the actors and the crew and for mm -hmm. myself and i react to mainly i start with amy and i ask her would you like you know uh, to start uh, uh we start on you and I, i i like to start on her since we designed the shots based on her pov based on her perspective mainly So once she starts and she can use the space and, you know, they arrive on the set, just use the space. I'm starting here with a 35 mil. And therefore, she can use the space and then we react and we rarely change the lens. Try to keep the distance between the characters and put the camera behind them. And then if they come closer, then we come closer. And uh, so we react to what they're doing and mainly to what Amy is doing. When she moves, we move, or we move with her, or we pan. Uh, and pay very attention to where she's looking at, so I can shoot what she's looking at. And and then I, and then we give also this privilege to uh, to to some other characters like Eliza and like Patricia, uh, Patricia's character uh, Clarkson, uh, who played Adora, the mother. And uh, and then it becomes uh, it becomes uh, uh, the the decisions are taken then in the in the cutting room. But, uh, right. Yeah. You give yourself lots of lots of uh, I wouldn't material. say I wouldn't say lot a lot because mainly it's about the main character mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, but sometimes we get out of this theory and we we if if needed be and 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 mm -hmm. often uh, we need to break it. And, you know. Well, well, let me let me let me switch over to David a second. You because you had in in under the. Uh, In the category of star casting, you had a very large, uh, celebrated uh, performer in the leading role, John Legend. Now, did John, I'm curious, did John, uh, he was an executive producer, did he come into the project before you, or did you, did you, were you, did you have any role in casting him? Um, yeah, no, he, he wasn't in the project when, when I came on. Nobody was on it, nobody was cast. Uh, and there was a period of, obviously, some weeks. You know, when we were thinking, well, you know, who is, who's going to be Jesus? Uh, and there were a whole um, range of issues about that for me, which were, you know, not least the fact that it had to have, you know, you know, it's 2018, and there had to be something kind of very. I wasn't thinking of, you know, somebody uh, playing a hippie out there, and so there were all sort of. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> when. The idea of John came up. I thought that's really interesting. I didn't know him. Um, John reacted very fast to the idea, actually, which surprised me because I thought he might be, you know, wary of putting himself um, into a situation, particularly, you know, a, a live situation like that. Um, plus, at the time, you know, I was pushing very hard for every element of the show to be live um, because not all of these musicals are necessarily like, you know, something mm -hmm. that. that Often the, the soundtrack, the music is <clears throat> is recorded, so things are more controlled. Uh, mm. And and I was going in the opposite direction. Um, I think you know NBC was sort of secretly hoping I might have a kind of small band of five, and then we <laughs> ended up with thirty two. <laughs> they were all live, um, and, and so the whole question about whether John would sort of really want to jump into that. But when he did jump in, um, you know, I was very impressed by the fact that he didn't come you know overly defended in the sense that he could have done mm -hmm. I, i i didn't feel like he was trying to um preserve himself other than the, you know the good sense to preserve yourself you know as a singer and your voice and that whole thing and uh um and uh, i i i just admired him very much but i think one of the things i i just felt very strongly at the outset that i needed to say to john was that You know, uh, for him not to worry about trying to turn himself into an actor, and I'm mean, I'm putting that in inverted commas because of course he's an actor, he's out there acting, but I didn't want him to be burdened by trying to be something other than himself. And and and, and there was a key right. to this, which is that you know it's called Jesus Christ Superstar. And what I was trying to express to John was, I know this feels uncomfortable, but as close as we can get to you in your own skin doing this, the better this is going to work. It's going to be truer. You'll be more relaxed. It'll be, you know. Um, and the day it happened um, was, I mean, this really specific thing happened when I, I, I suddenly 
saw the light go on in his eye and I thought, oh, this is so great because you you can be here now, which is all I wanted him to, you know, to feel that he could be. Uh, we had a, a set that involved a mosh pit and a live audience and all that. And it was basically a kind of L-shaped. I mean, we picked up a piece of, you know, my thought with this with our production designer Jason was let's take let's smash up the Sistine Chapel and bring a few fragments and stick it into the Brooklyn Armory and play this thing in this you know world with a live audience and uh, one edge of this space um, is 144 feet mm. of stage I mean that's like, so there's an audience down that side and then there was always like an L shape mm. And uh, and John, <laughs> his first entrance was sort of way up, you know. And I just said to him, oh, I tell you, actually, in the middle of this moment with Judas, and you've just come on, um, what about, uh, why don't we do a 144-foot hello? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, <laughs> what if you walked all the way down that 144-foot and just touched as many hands as you possibly can on your way in? You know, because it's Jesus Christ Superstar. And... Uh, and he went okay, and uh, <laughs> and the, and he, the first time he did it in our in our rehearsal room, and there was like four of us there, you know, me, sort of kind of whatever, and we all just. <laughs> um, but it was that moment when he, I, I just saw it in him, you know, and I thought, oh, okay, mm. you, uh, you can be here now. You you don't feel like you've got to play somebody else's Jesus or whatever. You're relaxed about the fact that you're John Legend, and that's going to be the wit of the event, you know, and. Uh, I, I just admired him so much for, for doing that. And, 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 and I'll say this, finally. Um, yeah, I, for, for, you know, there are some people you're just pleased to see. And uh, um, the thing I found about John was he just, he's one of those people who just carries with him a fundamental decency. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't fake it. And uh, that decency is something that, you know, is so kind of luminous. It's just a quality. You can't mess with that. And... Uh, um, and I didn't want him to sort of get angry where he didn't have to be angry. I didn't want it to get into a kind of du duo thing with Judas where we were just playing anger or hate, you know, because he's a good... And uh, his complexity just came out of him being this very, very kind of decent, watchful man. And uh, I, I, and it was very exciting to do that. Well, and I think a brilliant approach on your part, uh, dealing with a, a leading actor who who is not really... Uh, to my knowledge, not trained as an actor. No, it's not his so first thing. I, I, I think that's, mm -hmm. and it, it paid off uh, on screen. Ben, let's let's talk about your casting for a second. Uh, the three principals, absolutely terrific. Uh, Benicio del Toro, uh, uh, Paul, uh, just just stark, ravingly brilliant. Uh, but I have to say that for me, and I have a feeling for others. At the top of the list is Patricia, Patricia Arquette as Tilly. Uh, and, uh, um, she was just mesmerizing. I mean, and, and she's got this, you play this frumpy, whiny, sexually manipulative woman. What, 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 how, did, how did her casting come about? Did, I, I'm sure you cast her. Did you see that in her from the get-go, or were you surprised? Oh, well, I don't see her that way as a person. Um, and why not? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's a brilliant actress, and I think that's not a secret. And uh, and it just, from the very beginning, seemed to me that she could uh, have the bravery to disappear into this role. And uh, And I never doubted for a second that she would do what she needed to do to play the part. And um, so... She was uh, there from the very beginning. She stayed with the project as we were trying to put the project together, uh, trying to find a home for it, trying to uh, get it set up. Uh, for about a year, she was she was with it, just stayed with it when we it wasn't uh, actually a real thing. And um, I had known her. We we'd done a movie uh, twenty something years ago with David O. Russell, flirting with disaster, and we had. Been played a couple in that, and I and I remember having such a great experience with her, uh, and her doing things in that film uh, that were just so quirky and real, um, and without vanity in any way, uh, in playing a real uh, person. She just plays a real person, and you talk about a common uh, decency. 
uh, you know, that's there. And I feel Patricia has, uh, as a person, she's a very, very special person. She's a very generous person. And she brought that, ironically, to this character, which really is not a very, uh, I think, uh, as, as evolved human being as Patricia is. Yeah. Um, and she was willing to to um, go, go, just go into it. And it was not easy for her. I mean, she had to, she she gained a bunch of weight and she um, had to live in that skin for a long time. It was a long shoot. And she uh, had this process where she would come into it very much, I think, um, without uh it, it was her her instinct in the scene she would come into it with her instinct and usually her instinct was just it was right and uh she gave everybody around her who she was working with um the feeling that they could uh they could be a part of her process but i felt as a director that i was just sort of you know the same way with amy in the presence of an actor who's so instinctively good that you're just trying to sort of witness what they're doing and sometimes if you know give a little direction to like maybe go this way or go that way uh if there was something that i saw that i thought you know there was something to be explored i would suggest it and we would have discussions about it but um you know she really trusted that everybody was doing their job and that she could just go and and take the chances she needed to take and i think that trust that she puts in in the director in the other actors in the crew um because she really is she knows everything that's going on and she would be aware if um you know like if the, she felt like the sound man you know maybe like she would go like was the boom in the shot on that one i don't know i might have um uh you know or if there was like sound happening off camera that on somebody else's side of the, of the scene when they were doing it she would you know be very quick to tell people to be quiet and respect what the actor was doing she you know she looks out for people because she's such a good person and she knows the process so well and it was just uh you know for her uh she had to just dive in, and I think there were some very, very, very hard scenes for her to do. Well, one of the things I admired most about Dana Morrow was, was uh, and it has to do with her performance, but it also has to do with your approach to this material. And, and it was this, was this, what seemed to me to be this almost fanatical uh, commitment to realism, whenever, to, to what actually happened. Whenever there was a choice to be made, I could think of several choices in some moments when you could have done something, you could do the dramatic thing, or you could look to it, the situation, and look at what actually happened. And she seemed to embrace that, but so did you as a director. Does that, was that a part of your creed for cast and crew? Let's, let's, let's look at what actually happened instead of making a movie to, to well, put it badly? Yeah, I, yes, in that for me that was always the touchstone of like let's go and find out what really happened and that's usually going to be the most interesting thing. Um, but then there's that part of the process when you're developing the story where, at, at least for us, where we delved into the real events and the real details and then you have that and then you look at the script and you go, okay, I've got this script full of real events and real details but it's not that dramatic or, or necessarily <laughs> interesting. And so then you have to kind of let it go and find the story, the core of what the story is, and have the freedom to be to go away from that, and which we did. And then, as we came back to filming it, I, then I would come back to the reality with the technical advisors we had on set. So we always had somebody from the prison there in in terms of just telling us how something would actually happen in that room and what the um, procedure would be. And or there was the just the actor inspiration that sometimes didn't have to do with what really happened. Uh, you know, with Benicio, he would have you know all of these really, really kind of crazy and interesting ideas that came out of his own um, thought process for what Richard Matt was going through. But he, you know, Richard Matt was not alive, so he, he really, there was not much to go on in terms of what was going on in his head. So Benicio created that <coughs> based on the research he did. But sometimes that totally went off of reality. But uh, I would always be there with like, well, this is actually what really happened. And then you kind of go with whatever the best idea is and sometimes you try both things um and uh for patricia i think she was just constantly uh trying to go to the emotional sort of reality of this person the the emotional life of tilly 
and not judging her. And that was a big thing to not judge her and not to say she's a bad person or a good person. She's just a person in this situation. And, um, and that was, you know, that exploration always resulted in something that was really, um, you know, really interesting. The, uh, uh, and I want to talk about the prison, but I, 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 want to, I do want to talk about locations because that's directors, that's, it seems like in prep, that's the other half of the time you spend uh, uh, long moments in a van looking for the places to shoot your movie. How do you, uh, Jean Marc, how do you pick locations? How do you, uh, I mean, how many did you have in, the, in your movie? I mean, there it seems like, how many different places did you shoot? Did you did you find it all in one small town or? No, no, no. We uh, we had to shoot in L.A. and we uh, didn't find this. The, the main location was a Victorian house, the house of the uh, 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 the preaker, the uh, Camille preaker, her mother, and uh, and we were looking for it. John Pano, production designer, with his uh, with his team. Uh, uh, we're looking for it, and we looked. We looked in LA and in Georgia, and then, the, and then suddenly, pure coincidence, uh, somebody sent us a picture from Norton, California, above San Francisco, and there was this exterior Victorian house in the middle of nowhere, and it feel it could feel like Georgia. It was, it was green, by it was green here and there. It was like desert, like a little bit California, also, but. We could we could make it work, and uh, so that was the exterior. And then we were trying to find an interior that could match, and we didn't. So we we uh, we went uh, let's let's build the interior, and so we built uh, the house. We shot all of the interior. So that was a main 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 location where we shot a lot on stage here in L.A. We went two weeks in Norton, California, and about three weeks in Georgia to shoot in a small town next to Atlanta, two hours from Atlanta, called Barnesville. So Barnesville became Wind Gap. And, uh, that was your Wind Gap, Missouri. Wind yeah. Gap, Missouri, exactly. And, so, uh, because, so when you built the sets, you had a chance to really explore uh, Adora's character because it mm. seemed like a great reflection of this oh, yeah. obsessive uh, need for protection, uh, uh, perfection on her perfection, part. Perfection, exactly. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's her jail too, you know. Yes. And it's, it became so uh, precise and so anal in some ways, you know, and it's crazy, you know. It's uh, So John and his team, uh, uh, and the, the good thing is we could, we could create our own interior and we saw, uh, we saw a house on pictures that we loved, the staircase, and, and we had this idea of having Camille's room in a way where she couldn't get right away in her room, but she had to walk all around the other doors and go in front of her mother's place in order to go in her room. And uh, so we created that based on her house and not based on the one in mm -hmm. California because the interior in California wasn't good, but the exterior was amazing. So, and the thing we did that, 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 that was great too, we built the porch on stage so we could shoot, and we had a trans light all over the house, 300, almost 360 degrees. I was like 42 feet high. So that was a picture of the surroundings in Northern California. So we were shooting again with a 35, a very uh, high aperture at 1.4, 1.6. Mm -hmm. And that's where the focus bowler is like nervous because there's no depth of field. And he's like breathing next to me. And he... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but in order not to see that it's a trans light, it has to be out of focus. But we could we shot a lot of exterior inside on the on stage, where and and we shoot available light. Except there, Yves Belanger, the cinematographer, the DP, was happy to finally have his toys. I was on a rack that could come. The sun could come down. It could be cloudy. It could be bright sunny. It could be less. And we, I said, why don't you go from cloudy to sunny? So it changes. And then the, the, his gaffer built something. So in the, the same shot, we could go, it's, it's sunny, and then it becomes cloudy, which is, which is tricky to do on stage. But it's got to be quick, and they move a little bit of stuff. Uh, and uh, 
Well, while we're on the subject, and I'll work my way back over to the armory, but uh, while we're on the subject of locations, uh, I want to ask Ben about the prison, because I don't, I, I don't know how many of you directors out there have shot in a working prison. It can, I have. It can be a nightmare. There's some problems of movement and security and uh, uh, untold problems. So I want to ask you, uh, the prison is a major set piece in your film. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about how you put together the prison. Yes. Uh, well, so it's a real place, and it's a very unique uh, geographical situation where the prison is in the middle of the Adirondacks, uh, sort of dominating this <laughs> small town. And uh, it was basically, we needed to get the real prison to shoot, at least to shoot the outside of, um, because it was impossible to to really recreate that unless we were going to do visual effects where we would place the prison in, in the mountains. It, it was, we were six weeks before shooting, I'm not kidding you, we had no location <laughs> to shoot. Um, we were not getting help from the New York State Department of Corrections because they weren't excited about advertising the prison break. <laughs> um, and we tried for about a year, just getting nothing back from them. And we found a prison to shoot inside the walls, exteriors within the walls of the prison uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, at a, this place called Western State Penitentiary that had just been decommissioned. But for the actual outside of the prison and the yard, the north yard of the prison, which is on the side of the mountain, uh, which is this very unique uh, geographical setup that looks out over the mountains where the prisoners have their own courts, it was just impossible to recreate. And we um, had no, we had no set, we had no uh, location, and we had tried through all the channels. So finally, about six weeks out, I knew a guy. I had done a, a promotional video for the mayor of New York, and the guy who had done the video, I, I called him up and said, do you know anybody in the governor's office who maybe I could call, because the Department of Corrections is stonewalling us. And he said, I know somebody, let me get back to you. The next day, he sent me an email for the governor's chief of staff, and I wrote her an email. And basically, she emailed me back about a week later, and this was like getting, now it's five weeks out. And she said, well, how can we help you? And I explained our situation. And the next day, we got a, um, a conference call with the Department of Corrections. Somebody in the governor's office had talked to them, and they finally listened to our request. And we said, we'd like to open up the manhole, shoot outside of the prison walls, uh, at least, just for us. And, uh, and they granted our request. And then a few days later, I got a call from the chief of staff saying, the governor would like to talk to you. And I was both excited and a little petrified. <laughs> Because I didn't know what, what is this going to be the quid pro quo yeah, where right. it's like, okay, you can shoot there, but you got to, you know, tell the story the way you want to. And basically, he basically wanted to sit down and talk about what we were doing. He was really excited about the idea of the story. He had actually gone into the prison the day that they escaped and shot video, which we used as reference. And at the end of this talk where I told him who was, you know, pl who was playing Tilly and all this stuff, and he was just kind of fascinated by it. Then he said, well, well what can we do for you? And, and I knew that you know, we didn't have access to the North Yard where we wanted to shoot these scenes. And I thought of the 200 people back at the production office who had no location. And here's the governor saying, what can I do for you? And I was like, well, can we shoot in the prison? And he's like, you got to shoot in the prison. <laughs> and I just had this moment of thinking of all these people there who were going to be so happy. And so he granted us access to the to the prison, and then that opened up the floodgates for us, really, because then we went in and visited uh, and asked the people who work there if they would help us. And they were very resistant at first, obviously, because they didn't want this story to embarrass them. And uh, but then we developed a relationship with with them, and they uh, we were able to have technical advisors from the prison, uh, in, in addition to prisoners who were technical advisors, and. Uh, and we could shoot in the prison, and we were able to shoot for two days on the North Yard, but one day in the winter and one day in the summer, which uh, was just the you know probably for me the most exciting time of the whole shoot, and um, and then open up the manhole that they escaped out of, and and actually um, have the actors come out of the manhole and shoot the actors going in and out of the gates of the prison, uh, uh, Patricia and Eric Lang who played Lyle, so we would be waiting during shift changes while the the workers of the prison were going in and out and then have our actors go in and out. So we had a real um, you know, interaction with the people in the town. We ended up shooting up in the town for two months 
uh, and then for another two weeks and in, in, in two months in the summer for the escape, we shot backwards because we had to start the summer. So we did the escape first and then, um, and then for another two weeks in the winter time and the people in the town, there were about a thousand people who came out and auditioned to be a part of it. And, um, they ended up being a, a really, really important part of the, 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 the cast. And I think it made the story a lot fuller and a lot more real because they, they opened up to us. Um, uh. And I was, I, 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 we were talking before, I was, I was just stunning how you were able to achieve fall and winter, and I thought you must have used some trickery, but you just shot that long. You were there for two seasons. <laughs> yes, exactly. You were forever um, shooting this. Yeah, thing. Showtime was <laughs> surprised as well. Um, <laughs> the, we started in the end of August and shot September, and we actually caught the end of summer because we just, we, just at the very end, the leaves were turning because the leaves turned really early up there. And we shot up there for as long as we could. Then we moved south to outside of New York City and shot outside there. And then we moved into the prison set, which we shot in for a couple of months and went down to Pittsburgh for a few weeks. And that took us through October, November, December, and parts of January. And then we went back up to um, back up to Danamora and shot uh, the winter stuff for the very first episodes mm. last. So the very first day of shooting, we shot Paul Dano getting captured. That was his very first day of shooting. And then the next three days, which were Benicio's first three days, was him getting captured and killed. Wow. And then the Damn. fifth day of shooting was Patricia and Eric shooting at the Chinese restaurant when, where she has an anxiety attack uh, in the real Chinese restaurant where that happened. And that was her first day of shooting. So oh, the actors really were had this level of yeah. difficulty that you know nobody would, would be aware of. And they had to jump in and really kind of reverse engineer their performances, mm -hmm. you know, because Benicio's character really goes through right. such a change when he gets out, out into the world. So that was, that was more challenging, I think, for the actors than anybody right. else. Well, now let's contrast the, the world that, uh, that Jean-Marc and Ben have directed their movies in and, and go to the Jesus Christ Superstar Live. Uh, it, is a, it is a different model for David and for, for Alex. It's... You know, I, I, if you think about it, your your whole effort is a lot of pre-production, and you do the show in one take. I mean, it's like the that, yeah, production night. period is two hours long, and there's no post, basically. It's already all been done. Yeah. So finding locations for you... Uh, I would I, I would assume in this situation is largely a matter of the, the Garden of Gethsemane, the uh, the streets of Jerusalem. That's largely a matter of working with a production designer. Uh, I would I, to figure that out how that's going to be staged because it's all on one massive stage at an armory in Brooklyn. Now, d d did you guys start the planning of the sets and the and the choreography? It, were you joined at the hip immediately? You kind of you kind of suggested you were. How did how do you negotiate that one long prep period? How do you I how think do you pretty, work? Pretty early on, we started talking visual references and creative references, and and you reached out to Jason, our production designer, and, and started you know developing creative there. I mean, what we knew is, is is from an NBC point of view, it needed to be a rock concert, and that the the that kind of visceral energy in the room of the audience was very much part of the, the, the production design and needed to be, and, it, and, and the cast needed to be supported by an environment whereby you, you felt that energy in the space. Um, and and it, it was a real struggle to find space on the East Coast uh, in, around Manhattan um, that, that we could pull that off in, because somewhere, yeah. somewhere where there's, there's know, 2,000 seats... That there aren't that many options. No, there aren't, and that, it is a huge space. And uh, I, I think the other thing that we were on to very early was that you know we we really were conceiving of this in terms of an installation as opposed to a series of locations that right. we would go to with on a sound stage. If you see what I, mean. I mean, interesting. You know, when I first went into the armory just to have a look at it and see what it was. Um, uh, they were shooting the Irishman, Martin Scorsese's film, and, and and it was you know this vast space with all these different locations on it. You know there was a diner and there was five yellow New York taxi cabs stuck in a corner of the thing. You know it was thrilling, um, and it was a movie. Um, but what we were talking about precisely because it had to be a rock concert, and also because you know I I felt very strongly that. Um, 
you know the the nature of Jesus Christ Superstar is it's a one shot thing. It's 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 um it's not about. I mean, I know there's been a you know a very beautiful movie of it made where you do naturally because it's a movie you're going to different locations. But in this case, we knew that it needed to be um, one landscape, one landscape. But we had to get that landscape right. And and as Alex says, the fact that it was a rock concert gave us all kinds of issues, interesting issues, because the further we pushed it, the more we realised no we. We're still being too safe with where that audience is in relationship to the stage, and and bit by bit by bit. And I think crucially for us, dangerous. we talked very very early on about the experience for the viewers at home, not wanting it to be proscenium, wanting it to be more than that. You know, incredibly important for me when we when we do these live events that you place the viewers in the heart of the action, and and it, it doesn't feel like a, a proscenium, two dimensional, slightly more reserved PBS kind of presentation. But it's a very intimate storytelling format whereby you're trying to create uh, energy within the environment and trying to show the relationship between in situ audience uh, and cast. And ideally for the viewers at home, because you're leaning into this word live as part of your title, you're really trying to tell that story and, and tell it from the perspective, not only from the, of the cast interacting with each other and their characters, but also from the audience that are in that venue. And so you're always trying to get that right balance between closing a scene down and having intimacy and showing that storyline, but also at the right time, opening it up and, and, and sharing in that, that energy of the moment uh, and the reaction. And I think that, that leads very much in terms of you know, the, the, the placement of, of... Totally, that's really true. I mean, the fundamental thing to me, well, just in terms of staging and the rhythm of the space, was the thing about Superstar, concept album or not, is that it, it, they, the way they wrote it was that they would just layer on, you know, they would drop a character in musically and then drop the character out because another character came in musically because the thing was conceived musically. And so when it actually came to trying to manage sort of big, if, if you like, the kind of the, the epic social world of the thing and then have it suddenly contract to two people or one, it's doing that all the time. It's like a sort of beating heart. And so one of the technical problems we had was that it's not like, you know, we had to create one continuous two hours. And by the way, what you just said about the, <laughs> it is the strangest process because it, it, the way you build from our conversations, you know, we, we began, I was in Tokyo, Alex was in LA, Jason, the production designer was in New York. We were on Skype. It was like five in the morning in Tokyo where I was, you know, and we'd have this conversation about the Sistine Chapel and then I go and do something <laughs> in Japanese. And it's sort of great. And this thing built over months and gradually, we go, oh, and, we gradually and then we end up and you have the night and it's over. Uh, and I remember saying to somebody, well, I mean, you know, we are closing on the night that we're open. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm, I've done quite a lot on Broadway and so I'm familiar with, um, <laughs> you know, with the phenomenon. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just didn't think it was going to happen to me. Uh, <laughs> um, but it is very odd because it just reaches it. But the whole thing, everybody's rhythm is, and it is really interesting because everybody becomes focused to that two hours. Well, well, one thing that remains true is you have a, we all have a limited amount of time to do our thing. So you're, you're, you're putting this thing together. The whole ball of wax for you is the preparation is what we would normally call the pre-production time. Uh, I'm curious, uh, there is a choreography that needs to take place uh, among the cast, uh, blocking, uh, but it has to work in concert uh, with a choreography uh, with the camera uh, coverage as well. Uh, and for those of you who may not have seen Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, the, the, it was a virtual ballet of camera movement and uh, it was just brilliant in the way it was both staged and captured. But is there ever a can conflict? I, also, can I just, yeah. just I, I was in reference to that, watching that clip, it was, and I watched it live, it was so good. Um, it was, you, you did, I never saw one camera in that clip that was... Exactly. I mean, and that was all live. Exactly. So there were cameras that were getting out of the way of other cameras, and you never saw right. one. That's incredible. Uh, and then yeah. that's the challenge for me. Uh, uh, and when I storyboard and, and work work on a scene with with not only David but with the, a, a choreographer, if it's a big dance sequence, is designing not only primary coverage but then designing how 
as directors, we tell a visual story that's interesting, but, but it doesn't just end up being, again, come back to this word proscenium and play safe. You want to embed yourselves in the action. You want to, you want to get right into the heart of emotion and character development and interaction. Mm -hmm. And so design, I had approximately 14 cameras on the show, um, approximately 1,700 shots. Everyone has to be, ex each one of those shots needs to be executed pristinely and, and, and accurately. The real challenging shots are the steady cam shots. We had two steady cams and, and the, the really the, the dynamic shots um, and, and a, 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 like a, a, a spider cam across the, the length of the, the venue. So when you choreograph for those shots, you're, you're, and, and, and I, we script and call back shots in tempo musically. So the, the, the actors uh, blocking and, and song and dance is is in harmony with us calling back the shots musically. So there's a in terms of of, of executing each shot, it's happening at a preconceived uh, and agreed point, like a musical score, uh, like an operatic score, and that allows us that that precision to replicate and to be incredibly precise about nuance, about angle, about composition, size of frame, uh, and dynamic of shots. So if a steady cam's coming in for into the middle of the environment. We know, and I say it has three bars and seven beats to, to do a 360 degree move around the actor. And then I give it a, a secondary cue, a keyframe to pull back. And he has seven beats to pull back before I take the next close up, just so that they clear frame. And, and that choreography that you talk about, that's the hardest bit of the equation for me as a, a director, because I'm trying to create this, this, this kind of visual language all the way through that is sensitive to the primary narrative but also it's a, it's a great entertaining experience for the viewers. I want to know where you get the camera operators. I mean, is there New England Patriots, where do you, where do you recruit these guys? Feed them a, feed them a lot of fizzy drinks. <laughs> um, uh, no, they are definitely some of the best in the business. Uh, yeah, we use the same. That's fantastic. Um, I, I just, uh, we, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to, uh, uh, I just wanted to briefly touch on uh, the production process. Uh, I want to slip, slip back to Ben if we could, the, the sequences in the escape, because this is just, as a director, I was knocked out and maybe others were too, with the way that you made engrossing, captivating, nail-biting, the escape through that ridiculous uh, two and a half foot pipe. Yeah. So that, talk a little bit about that because I saw what I, I think was snorkel cam. I mean, how, do you, how did you get inside that pipe Right. Uh, how did you do that, man? It was uh, it was an 18 inch pipe, actually. Ugh. Yeah, uh, I mean the hardest thing was getting I think the actors to be okay, feel okay in the pipe. You know, they didn't. <laughs> and Paul had to spend a lot of time in the pipe. We never used a snorkel cam. We just had a section of pipe um, that we then had a camera on a little kind of on some wheels on like a little sort of like dolly that would uh, you know be inside the pipe. So we just would pull it in front of uh, Paul and pull go back and forth with him. And then we cut a channel in one section of pipe that was about uh, you know four inches wide so that we could have stick the lens of the camera there for side angle shots to go along with him. But Paul had to just go deep into that pipe and do all those scenes. And uh, that was, I think, the most challenging thing. And then Benicio didn't love the pipe, and I don't blame <laughs> him. Um, and, uh, you know, we tried to do that stuff as quickly as possible. But all of that, uh, you know, the goal for me was to try to feel the claustrophobia of that experience because it was just so... It worked. I mean, it, it was just such a nightmare to think that this guy was going into a pipe where he didn't couldn't get out in the middle of the night in a prison where nobody knew he was. And he had to figure out how to cut his way in and out of that pipe. Um, and did that for you know three months going down there yeah. cutting by hand so that to me that was so fascinating how that actually happened uh, that I just wanted to try to really get the you know the feeling of what it was like to be in there with him yeah uh, we'll telescope uh, really to the end because this has been fascinating I wouldn't have changed a thing uh, a quick question for Jean Marc the the extraordinary use of what traditionally is called flashbacks uh, in which you were able to get inside the head of Camille. Uh, you did it in the most intriguing way, often without the absolute, often with silence. Uh, there was nothing of the stinger that you so often see in films. Um, it was very nonlinear. It was very inside the central character's head. 
was that largely created in post, or did you have it in mind all along? It was created by Marty Knoxon in episode one, and then the other writers uh, followed up uh, they, they, uh, uh, on the page. And then, uh, and then we, we became creative on the set and added some. And same thing in post where we got some ideas uh, in the cutting room where why don't we push that, that impression that where this story is told from Camille and why don't we go in her head and why don't we use this device to do what the book was doing with words. She has an obsession with words. She used them to heal and to harm. And, uh, and we didn't have any voiceover. And at the beginning, I was challenging, you know, uh, I was a little bit uh, thrown away when I read the first episode from Marty and Gillian. And what do you mean there's no voiceover? This is the quality number one of the book. The, 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 her, her, her voice, her, her internal monologue is so powerful. The way this woman sees life, her environment, her family, her past, and it's, it's amazing. So we, we, we started to realize on the set that, oh, we're going to use this and create, she's going to be the only one who sees words in her reality. And when we'll cut to a different perspective from someone else, we'll, the words won't be there. So when she feels a word burning on herself, she'll see it. And then when we cut to an objective point of view, which isn't her point of view, the word isn't there. And we started to do that in flashbacks too, where she, in her head, it, it, she's thinking about a specific word and then whoops, it appears in, a, in, in her reality, even in her past, without using the sound of the past, keeping the sound of the present time, so it helps, and it helps, and, and, and it's a funny because it's a grammar, uh, it's a vocabulary that I started to use, that we started to use with some editors back then, a few films ago, uh, with Café de Flore, a film that uh, we've done in 2011, and then we pushed it more in Wild, and Demolition, and even in BLL, and you know, I'm repeating myself, you know, from one film <laughs> to the other, and there you go, and they were, but, but it's funny how, how our language is evolving and how it serves stories, even though they're very different, but, but it becomes, uh, I, I love to tell stories and try to go into their mind and to communicate this to the audience so they feel what they feel, what the ca main characters are seeing or hearing or thinking or dreaming or fantasizing and, and we play with reality, linear or not, and, and uh, it's a great toy. Well, I want to I want to thank uh, these four extraordinary directors for sharing uh, their artistry with us tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, three uh, terrific films, along with Maniac and and, and uh, Paterno. But it's uh, it's it's wonderful of you to share time with us. Uh, often in this affair, we will have questions from the audience. We're not going to do that tonight because we're going to go straight to our cocktail reception. I hope that you will all join us there. You might have a chance to ask the question that didn't get asked. You will have a chance to meet our, our terrific host committee of other directors who are here. They will probably be around the bar if you're looking for them. Uh, I, uh, one may be under the bar, I can think of. Mikhail? Uh, and uh, we are... Um, it's a marvelous art form. Uh, n there is not a genre out there that takes, uh, that is, uh, I think television, uh, limited series, long form is doing as good a work as any screen anywhere on the planet. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Join us for a drink, and uh, we'll give you that. Thanks to you, Mr. Mike. Thank you.